To the ancient Greek aristocrat, danger and hardship were seen as good things. Even fear was a god they celebrated. It was actually comfort and security that were seen as the true dangers. Where they tried to live up to the mighty myths of Heracles and Odysseus and excel through adversity, we try to make life as comfortable as possible. Our modern value system has been completely reversed from that of classical times. Nietzsche, the 19th century philosopher, saw this with astounding clarity and tried to warn us away from the temptations of an easy life. Yet many have fallen into this trap. If I gave you the option of an easy life full of comfort and pleasure, or a hard life full of danger, beauty, and meaning, what would you choose? One inevitably leads to shallow misery, while the other makes the soul sing with vitality and growth. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure. An adventure? Now, I don't imagine anyone west of Bree would have much interest in adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Make you late for dinner. <laughs> mm. Imagine if Bilbo Baggins or Frodo, the hobbit from Lord of the Rings, never left the Shire. Would you want to read that story? It'd be boring as hell. And yet, that is the story most of us write for ourselves unconsciously. We say we want a great life, but aren't willing to pay the price for it. Whenever suffering or uncertainty arise, we run from it or cower in pain. When shit gets difficult, we seek the easy path and tend to let fear dictate our paths rather than courage. We want success without effort, adventures without danger. There is limitless potential for greatness within each of us, but most will never realize it because they live for comfort rather than victory. On the extreme end of humanity, many people want robots and AI to do everything difficult for them. They want pills for every discomfort and entertainment for every dull hour. If the Soma drug of the brave new world was invented, most would take the dehumanizing bliss pill without a second thought. No wonder Nietzsche said, society has tamed the wolf into a dog, and man is the most domesticated animal of all. The Shih Tzu is a direct descendant of the gray wolf of China. Years of comfort and breeding for the weaker qualities destroyed the very essence that made it a wolf. Wolves are fierce, self-reliant, and powerful creatures that could take down a thousand-pound caribou. They fight and live wild, free, and are connected to one another. The Shih Tzu, however, is dependent on its master. Rolling around in its baby carriage and fed consistent meals, it has become a shadow of its former self. Its instincts and feelings are dimmed. Its bark and bite are nullified. Its soul has been trimmed down to the faintest echo of the original wolf spirit that prowled the hills. The Shih Tzu may be cute, but only the wolf is majestic. Unfortunately, we more closely resemble a Shih Tzu than our wolf-like ancestors, and we wonder why we are miserable while swiping away on screens in dark rooms, eating frozen meals, and shunning our natural instincts. This is what the Greeks and Nietzsche warned against, the cult of weakness. Nietzsche foresaw this remarkable de-evolution and warned of the coming last man, which we covered in the previous video. The last man is akin to a shih tzu, someone who lives a superficial life without aim or aspiration, as a slave to their weaker nature. Today, we are talking about the antidote to the last man. If you're watching this, you're probably one of the brave spirits who reject modernity and want to bring forth the highest version of yourself and culture. In Nietzsche's philosophy, this aspiration is the prerequisite for greatness, along with learning to live heroically and suffer well. So much of my own life has been a desperate struggle through resistance, hardship, heartbreak, and fear to bring forth the potential I feel inside. Along the way, the lessons and stories of heroes and warrior philosophers from the past have inspired me most. Nietzsche was one of those inspirations. He sought to elevate what makes man most healthy and spiritually alive. And his heroic philosophy has been a sweet nectar through times of trouble. He saw that the greatness within man could only be manifested through great aim, self-overcoming, 
and from acquiring a taste for suffering and danger. This video is about the latter. Here in the first video in Nietzsche's Guide to Greatness, we are diving into his advice for the free spirits of tomorrow and how suffering makes you beautiful. Thanks for joining Wisdom Warriors. I'm Christian. Hit that bell notification for more videos like this. Let's dive into it. Also, mark your calendars. My book, The Psychology of Slaying Dragons, launches October 30th. Link below to sign up for the launch. Part 1. Life Affirmation For believe me, the secret for harvesting from existence, the greatest fruitfulness and the greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. The problem is, is suffering sucks. Getting sick, breaking your arm, losing something or someone you love, feeling lonely pain, it's all tragic. And no one can fix that about life, no matter how hard they try. Unfortunately, we don't have a positive sense for the tragic drama of living anymore, not like the ancient Greeks anyway, and as a result, we have lost our taste for danger and exalted suffering. Nietzsche identified two approaches to life and the inherent suffering it holds, life denial or life affirmation. Life denial is the chosen path of the West. I call it the way of the Shih Tzu. Life deniers negate the way of nature the way of strength, and pursue safety and comfort externally. They hate suffering and pain and discomfort as evil things, so they try to escape it. They try to fix it. These life deniers try to make the world perfectly safe and equal, as to make existence as easy as possible for them and as safe as possible for the herd of shih tzus. That is their highest value, making life easy and equal and safe. To these life deniers and preachers of equality, Nietzsche would ask, what is the purpose of civilization? Is it to make everyone safe and pacified with pleasure, or is it to produce higher types of men and women who can push the human species forward? Is not the production of high culture and radically free and vital human beings the purpose of all of this society stuff? Nietzsche would say we have lost our aim. And without an aim, we are paving our way to hell with good intentions. Life affirmation is the opposite path to life denial, and it was Nietzsche's solution to creating the most robust type of person and civilization. Life affirmers do not seek to fix nature's way, they seek to thrive through challenge. They affirm the wild, mysterious, and marvelous ordeal of living as it is. They do not seek to escape suffering, but overcome it. They revel in competition and in conquering themselves. As a result of this approach, they build up their self-reliance and internal resources instead of relying on external securities to protect them. Where life deniers become dependent on other people and institutions for their safety and well-being, life affirmers take full responsibility for themselves. Life affirmers live dangerously where other people stay safe. They choose resistance over ease, and because of this spirit of heroism, they become free. Life denial or life affirmation represent the two possible paths we can take to deal with suffering and uncertainty. One makes you progressively weaker, while the other makes you stronger and more profound than ever before. Nietzsche saw that our entire moral system as a people, we'll come to reflect which path we choose to walk. Do we value equality and safety for the herd as the highest ideal, or heroism, nobility, and the production of high culture? I'm not arguing that one set of values is totally unimportant, but that we have to get clear on what is most important. I just read The Giver, a fabulous book depicting a society that first appears as a utopia led by progressive social systems and a wise circle of elders. Everything is set up under the principle of sameness. There is no contrast, no great pain or inequality or suffering. Everything is orderly and perfect. All the systems work smoothly. Everyone is safe and there is no social or personal disharmony whatsoever. Even death is removed from society and re-termed a release from the community. As you read further though, this once utopia slowly turns into a dystopia of a disturbing variety. Under the sameness, it feels as if the very essence of life has been removed. 
The main character slowly awakens to this dystopia after he was chosen to receive the dreams and memories of the world before the sameness. He was mesmerized by the memories of cold and hot and snow and changes in the seasons. He was overwhelmed by the majesty of color because up until then, everything in his world was whitewashed gray. He realized that war, suffering, attachment, and pain had been eradicated from his community, but with them went love and a sense of family and excitement and beauty. In whitewashed equality, there was no vitality left in life. Without great pain and trials, there was no joy and exultation. There was no great grief, sorrow, or true feeling. In total sameness, there was no valleys or peaks, just a dull happiness that was not true happiness at all. This book, The Giver, and others like The Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, provide a beautiful warning for modern times. When we try to legislate and manage society to make everyone equal, safe, and happy, life loses its zest, its power, its love. Personal utopia, or a collective utopia, is not earned through denying life and trying to fix it, but only through affirming the struggle of life as it is. Every golden age of humanity, from ancient Greece to the Renaissance, has come from this heroic mentality of life affirmation. Nietzsche said in the Genealogy of Morals, quote, He even seeks it out provided he has shown a meaning for it, a purpose of suffering. The meaninglessness of suffering, not suffering itself, was the curse that lay over mankind so far. All right, here's the deal. If you want to live an excellent life and bring forth your greatness from within, you have to learn to see suffering as a good thing. Let me repeat that. You need to see suffering as a good thing, even a great thing. You must learn to embrace discomfort, pain, heartache, emotional distress, and especially resistance and fear as worthy things and direct them towards your highest aim. You see, your highest form, your most dominant life, lies on the other side of the highest resistance. If you want to become the man you could be, you need to retrain your mind to see resistance and pain and even suffering as positive things in life. I just want to jump in here and say that I have an entire chapter in my book called Heroic Suffering and Others on Worthy Aim and Self-Overcoming. There's so much practical steps and philosophy and exercises in those chapters that I can never possibly hope to cover in a video like this. So go read more in there. In short, to fully affirm life, you must possess a strong enough why. When the boxer aims to be a world champion, all the blood, sweat, and tears become meaningful rather than miserable. Most people wouldn't last one hour in his training, but for him, the pain only lights a fire in his spirit. Because he's committed to an ideal, he lives above suffering in a sense. I love the scene from Batman Begins where Bruce Wayne commits to becoming a symbol of something greater. When we do this in our own lives, it puts all of our suffering in perspective because all of a sudden we have a purpose, a meaning in the pain. A vigilante is just a man lost in the scramble for his own gratification. He can be destroyed or locked up. But if you make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to an ideal, and if they can't stop you, then you become something else entirely. Which is? Legend, Mr. Wayne. This is the way of the warrior and the way of self-actualizers. We must fix our sights on a worthy ideal that inspires us and dedicate ourselves wholeheartedly to excellence in its fulfillment. The Ubermensch is the highest aim of man in Nietzsche's eyes, an ideal we will investigate later. But what's important here is that we choose to suffer willingly for something greater than our petty lives. We must rise to the challenges of living and redeem the pain of life in some way. This shift is literally the polar difference between the last man and higher types of individuals. The higher types fight. They fight to affirm their suffering and rise to overcome it.
In this overcoming, they grow deeper and more powerful than ever before. Loneliness, for instance, is a good thing. Most don't see it that way. Most seek to escape it through Tinder, drinking, video games, or shallow, stupid relationships. I've personally been dealing with a lot of feelings of loneliness this past month, and it has been a practice not to distract myself or take just any hand extended toward me unless it is of the highest quality person. Sitting on the mountain by myself the other night, a voice came to me. It said, loneliness is a gift. Channel the pain into deep, creative, and spiritual effort. That voice was right. I'll not always be alone or have such quality time for creative and spiritual depth. So instead of longing for a different, more easy reality, I chose the one I have and brought the fire of my spirit into it. That is the path Nietzsche advised, the path of self-overcoming, of rising into adversity. Oddly enough, suffering with honor and meaning tends to bring the most intense feelings of joy and connection with the profound world around me. It brings me alive. The internal shift towards heroism amidst hardship and discomfort is the key to your greatness, but this skill cannot be taught. You must figure out for yourself how to invoke the heroic spirit in your dark hours. It is always hard. The hero call is difficult to answer, but absolutely transformative. So many people let the weak voice in their heads win. They live as a slave beneath fear, resistance, and suffering. But the path of the warrior, of the ubermensch in a sense, is to overcome these dragons and transmute darkness into light. For life affirmers, strength is the solution to suffering, not comfort and safety. If you wish to live the good life, to thrive in excellence and beauty, you must become stronger. You must learn to channel the pain of life into deeper love, wisdom, and power. Heroes rise to the occasion in the ordeal of living, and this is your call. If you want the full guide to Nietzsche and heroism in the modern day, I encourage you to get a copy of my new book, The Psychology of Slaying Dragons. After two years of writing about heroism and the warrior's way and facing so many setbacks, I'm so excited to announce the launch date for October 30th. By the way, you can get the remove chapter for free right now. Link in the description below for that. So go get yourself a copy or hit that bell notification below to be notified of the launch and to get more videos like this. This is Wisdom Warriors. I'm Christian. Have a badass, dangerous kind of day. Peace.